welcome to today's session of the course Introduction to World Literature. In this session, we are looking at a 2013 essay by Kathleen Shields. It's titled Challenges and Possibilities for World Literature, Global Literature and Translation. The crux of this essay is on looking at the practice of translation from an entirely different point of view, trying to see how a different kind of an approach or a more focused approach on the practice of translation may yield a lot of fruitful results for reading world literature itself. The main argument of Shields' essay is that get his concept of wealth literature as he had used the term originally for world literature, it was grounded in translation practice. If you recall some of our early discussions on the term wealth literature and how world literature emerged as a concept in the late 18th and early 19th century, you may also re remember that translation, the circulation uh, in, in different uh, countries, in different traditions, those were the basis on which the idea of world literature was grounded. And in Shields' essay, she also tries to play with this idea that in creating a canon representing the best of each nation, translation occupied center stage. And Shields is trying to question the nature of this occupation, the nature of the importance that translation hasn't had in world literature. And she's encouraging us to look at translation as a political act, as something which is not limited to linguistic or philological frameworks, but something which has an overarching geopolitical significance. The essay can be accessed in this link. At the outset of the essay, Shields talks about four major challenges in the context of world literature. One, the nation state is weakening the kind of significance that nation states had in the 19th century and even in the early 20th century is getting increasingly weakened in the contemporary. And the idea of wealth literature, perhaps as a consequence of this, is also in decline. And she also tries to link this up with the uh, emergence of with the rise of English language as a supra language or as a global language. And then she draws her attention to the third challenge, which is asymmetries and relations between languages. And she draws her attention to the small number of translation languages which are becoming more market, which also means that it's not as if all languages are getting translated into different languages. Literatures in only particular languages, literatures which occupy only particular kinds of political and social significance are getting translated into certain languages. And here again, she links this up with the idea of the significance of English language, where we find more translations to English language than to any other language. And on the contrary, we do not find enough translations happening uh, from English language towards other languages either. And finally, as a challenge, and at the same time as a possibility, she's also introducing us to the idea of digital reading and how the digitization of the materials, digitization of literature also brings in new challenges and new prospects for world literature. The first half of Shields' essay has to do with understanding translation. She tells us about different modes of translation and she also alerts us to the idea that translation cannot be and need not be seen as a singular monolithic concept. And she reminds us that in the beginning, in the first phase, translation was perhaps seen as a mediating force in multiple bilateral contexts between literatures of Europe. And it was in this context that Goethe himself had used the term wealth literature because he found that his own works were being translated and they were in circulation in different parts of Europe. So it was seen as a mediating force, especially in the context of how 19th century Europe also began to be divided into different nation states. Also how 19th century Europe began to see a lot of divisive forces at work and translation was one such thing which could perhaps act as a bridge across cultures, across nations and across traditions. But now when we look at translation, Kathleen Shields reminds us, it operates as a pyramidal model. There is a certain pyramid in place where English serves as the base of all kinds of translations. English language serves as a foundational base for all translation practices across the world. 
and this is the phrase that she uses. Literature in English, literature translated into English, literature written to be translated into English, then literature in English. They become the dominant forms. So it is all about literature which is written either in English or about the kind of literatures which are written to be translated into English so that they are accessible to a certain geopolitical space so that they become part of a certain kind of a canon which has been designed and devised in particular ways. So there is a very evident shift in the way that we understand translation from being seen as a mediating force across literatures of Europe. We find that today there is a shift towards a more unmediated supra literature. This is the term that she uses for literatures available in English or literatures originally written in English. So from translation being a mediating force across literatures, across traditions, there is a move towards a single language, a single kind of traditional literature which according to Kathleen Shields is also an unmediated supra literature. Mapping the ways in which world literature has been defined is a useful trajectory to continue with and Shields uses the threefold definition given by R.K. Dasgupta in 1967. And there are three ways in which Dasgupta attempted to define world literature. One as a sum total of all literatures of the world. Secondly, as works in the different literatures of the world which have attained world recognition. And thirdly, as different literatures of the world conceived as one literature. So we are increasingly using the uh, definition, the second and third definition more and more because the first definition, the sum total of all literatures of the world, it is an almost impractical task to bring together all literatures. In the context of the definitions, the second one and the third one, we are also talking about a move from national literatures towards a single world literature. So the question, this is a practical question or not, that is perhaps something that we need to discuss in another lecture. Given these definitions and the various ways in which this has been working, she also reminds us that translation continues to be one of the foundational practices which continue to be important because to be able to be seen as one, there should be some kind of a unity which now can be seen in the way in which English language is increasingly emerging as a supra literature. Here she is also clarifying that Gete's concept can be seen at best as a structural sketch now. Gete's idea of well literatura found in his letters written to Eckermann. This was during the period between 1780 and 1820 from the late 18th century till the early 19th century. It could be said that this was the period during which the idea of world literature itself emerged if we can take get his use of the term world literature as one of the starting points. So it, during this phase from the late 18th till the early 19th century, in this phase Europe was going through a number of transitions and there was much debate going on about translation itself as a way of mediating between the domestic and the foreign. And this as uh, reminded earlier, this was one of the ways in which conflicts could be resolved and this was also a way in which the domestic and the foreign, the inside and the outside could come together with little conflict. So it's, it was in this context that the need for translation, the need for a single world literature, the need to conceive of a body of literature which is beyond the boundaries of nation states, which is beyond the boundaries of languages and traditions. It was in such a context that this need itself had emerged. So this again brings us back to the significance of the translation and translation practices. So why are we talking about translation? Kathleen Shields takes us through this journey and she tells us in detail about the ways in which translation practices evolved. In 19th century Europe, we find that the nation states are being created and alongside there is also the emergence of an idea of a transnational literature. So there is a way in which these two seemingly different movements go parallelly. The nation states of course assert individuality and the importance of being specific, the importance of the insight. But the idea of transnational literature on the other hand celebrates the coming together of these differences and celebrate the importance of this connection, this continuing contact between the inside and the outside. And there is a way in which Shields tries to connect these 
various disparaging things in a single practice which is translation and translation according to her is an important tool for transmission and exchange there is no doubt about that that is one of the basic understanding that is one of the basic functions of translation but at the same time it could foster dialogue and understanding between nations here it ceases to be the owners of the writers or translators it ceases to be the owners of the publishing houses there is a larger political function which translation begins to play rather inadvertently and at the same time this cultural mediation she argues could compensate for the arrogance intolerance and ethnocentrism of the nation state this also ties up with the various arguments put forward by Goethe, Marx and Engels where they talk about the need for overcoming national literatures the need to move beyond the national literatures and talk about the transnational literature talk about world literature and if you recall one of the earlier sessions Tagore also was hinting towards this when he gave a lecture on Vishwa Sahibya, again loosely translated as world literature. When he was asked to talk about comparative literature, he, was, he chose to talk about world literature, about comparing and amalgamating different traditions and different uh, literary backgrounds into a seemingly one strand of literature. And this was a need of the hour, uh, Shields again reminds us, because this was the age, this was the century when different nation states were being created and this mediation in the form of translation was extremely imperative. It played a literary role, a cultural role and also a political role. Kathleen Shields finds in Toyn Berman's definition uh, to be very useful. The essence of translation is to be an opening, a dialogue, a cross-breeding, a decentering. So here it, at this point we begin to look at translation as a practice which is serving a higher purpose. It is not just about the words which are being translated, it is not just about a story which is being made available into a different language or a poem or a lyric or an epic which is being made available into another language. It is also about opening up the worlds, it is about initiating dialogues, it is about crossbreeding and very importantly it is about taking away the center. Unlike the early modernist period when the lack of center was seen as a catastrophe, where it was seen as a disaster. In the contemporary, there is again and again a need being felt to decenter, where the absence of a center is seen as an enabling fact. The absence of a center also means that the distinction between the center and the periphery, the center and the margins are slowly becoming insignificant, if not uh, entirely absent. This leads us to the next segment in Shields' essay where she is looking at translation as a political act. Translation, she points out, is also now functioning as a one-way bridge and this is a kind of a bridge which has to be destroyed or which gets destroyed inadvertently when it has been crossed over and she notes it is important, translation as an activity is important for the creation of world literature but fades into background once this ambition is achieved. So it is not seen as a two-way act, rather it is ceased to be a two-way act, it is more like a one-way bridge and here Shields is deliberately drawing her attention to the flip side of the transition that translation had been facing. She quotes Mona Baker to explain this further. Mona Baker argues that translation can also prevent dialogue block contacts and support ethnocentrism on a global scale in the so-called war on terror. This needs to be contrasted with the point that we just observed Antoine Berman's argument that the essence of translation is to be an opening, a dialogue, a cross-reading and a decentering. From that in the contemporary there is also the risk of translation preventing dialogue, blocking contacts and supporting ethnocentrism, especially in the context of the war on terror. Uh, Emily Apter's book, The Impossibility of Translation, also talks extensively about the absence of translation or rather the irrelevance of translation in this context of war on terror. We shall perhaps take a detailed look at it in one of the later sessions. While it is a matter of debate whether translation has ceased to be an enabling 
factor in terms of promoting dialogue, in terms of promoting mutual interaction. It is also important to underscore the main point that Kathleen Shields is trying to drive home here that, that translations of literature are inevitably connected to politics. Translation is essentially a political act and word recognition though it may be present as a very innocuous a uh, simple straightforward thing. World recognition also does not happen without controversy. These are two elements which she tries to pursue in the rest of her essay where she continues to argue that translation needs to be seen as a political act and it needs to be taken away from being solely a linguistic or a philological activity and that world recognition there is no given thing or there is a there is no given formula there is no given framework for world recognition that it is also fraught within a lot of controversies. She gives the example of the selection of Nobel laureates and she points out that this process the selection of Nobel laureates have always been a fairly political act. 1930 Nobel Prize where Rabindranath Tagore the Indian the first non-European to receive the prize that was in 1913 and this happens just before the world war. Shields very effectively situates this selection, this nomination and this winning by to go within this political context and in her own words this act of not giving it to a European as a way of avoiding having to decide between countries on the verge of war. So this was according to Shields a, an easy way out, some kind of reconciliation, an attempt at reconciliation through this uh, announcement of the Nobel Prize. One may choose to have a different opinion, one may choose to disagree with the point that Shields is making but what is important here is the way in which she is trying to identify the political elements which are also inherent in the idea of world literature, in the, conce in the conception of world literature and the processes through which world literatures are framed and this sort of a response is also extremely important because we cannot completely ignore the many, the seemingly natural or the seemingly commonsensical elements which are part of these loaded terms. Shields continues to pursue this point and she draws her attention to the fact that she can see two Tagores. One is uh, the Tagore writing in Bengali and the other is this Bengali writer, the Indian Bengali writer who is translating himself into English. And she of course also reminds us of the role that uh, W. B. Yeats played in promoting Tagore as a universal figure and the way in which she tries to bring together these two Tagores, the one who is writing in Bengali during the high nationalist phase exclusively for local regional language readers and the other Tagore who is also translating himself into English, notably not any other Indian language but into English and this is a way in which Tago himself perhaps tries to position himself as a writer who can be accessed by the world and this world of course is a limited world given that it is a world inhabited by the ones who can access works in English language, who can read works in English language and this work can only be circulated in those areas where English is uh, used as a literary language. And Shields finds the case of Tagore very pertinent and she continues to state that the case of Tagore illustrates the ambivalence of supranational literature toward translation and this happens in the early 20th century and Shields is also reminding us that translation and the creation of world literature, the creation of a world canon, they were always political act. It was always already political that it is now hard to take the political element out of these and see them as pure works of translation, see them as pure acts of pure processes which made certain works into world canon or world literature. It is in this context that Shields also tells us about the fate of the local. When the local, the regional is getting translated, it becomes forgotten as soon as the writer makes it into the world stage. In her words, translating the local becomes forgotten once the writer has made it onto the world stage. 
and here translation merely becomes a way of paying lip service to the particular while erasing its particularity. I repeat, translation becomes a way of paying lip service to the particular while erasing its particularity. If you use the same example that uh, Kathleen Shields has used, when Tagore translates his work from Bengali to English, of course, it's a significant act, but at the same time, the particular, the local, the work which is originally there written in Bengali, it loses its significance and it, the, the particularity of the work also gets erased because it becomes more generic. It becomes more global with less local or less regional flavor. Of course, this is not to say that translation hence needs to be berated as a practice because it challenges. Shield's intention uh, here is to draw attention to the many things which are otherwise overlooked when we are looking at translation practice, especially in the context of world literature. And this process is very organic. It brings in a lot of change while it is at work. And Shields is telling us about the changing literary cultures when translation as a practice begins to intervene in world literature. There's no other way in which world literature can be made accessible translation, translating works from one language to the other, from one tradition to the other is perhaps the only way in which works can be made accessible and this causes a lot of changes within literary systems, within literary cultures. And in the contemporary, Shields notably points out that what has now happened is the reinforcement of English language as a supra language. And she also says that a series of world events, political and social historical events also had played an important role in uh, affirming and reinforcing the supremacy of English language. The fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the apartheid are two significant events that she quotes. And she also points out that a number of world languages such as Arabic, Hindi, French, German, Chinese and Russian, they are all yielding to English in the hierarchy of translations. Remember the pyramidal model that she spoke about at the outset of uh, her essay where she was drawing her attention to the way in which the base, the foundational base in this pyramid had become English language and there is a way in which the hierarchy was beginning to be set in a different paradigm altogether. And English language, the, the works being made available in English is now serving as a basis for other translations as well. And this is a point that she continues to pursue throughout her essay. There are a couple of other things also which have contributed to the changing literary systems and cultures, the advent of the new media, the digitization of text, and of course the spread of economic modernization to every part of the globe. And these need to be seen, these different things which are happening in different segments and different sectors, they need to be seen together to be able to understand the change which, which has come about in literary cultures. I read out this excerpt from Kathleen Shields' essay. What is the current function of centers of literary production and reception such as Paris, Frankfurt or London? What's happening in these key centers of literary production? Why literature is becoming more and more delocalized? It is probably the case that it is the constellations with the temporary sub-centers constantly shifting and changing between world literatures and minor literatures which play an important part. In the circulation of more or less prestigious texts, translation as well as non-translation plays an increasing but invisible role in the power relations between languages and literatures. She is bringing about a significant difference between languages and literatures and the availability of these different works in different spaces. And she's also questioning the role played by these centers of literary production in the contemporary. While there is an increasing move towards delocalization, there's an increasing move towards conceiving the literatures as one, as a world canon, we also realize that power relation. There's a hierarchy at work. There's a certain kind of a privileging of certain works, particularly in this context, the ones available in English language, which we can see. As a corollary, the idea of national literature also undergoes a radical change. When Kathleen Shields is drawing her attention to the various challenges that world literature is facing in the contemporary, especially in the context of translation practice, she's not entirely underscoring a very pessimistic view about translation. 
she is drawing her attention to how one needs to be attentive to the changes which are also being organically built into this process and her take on the changing idea of national literature also needs to be seen in that context. In Shields words, it is certainly not a national literature but a literature that is composed in order to be translated, most frequently to be translated into English. And here the idea of the local becomes very, very problematic. There is local literature which is produced, there is regional literature which is produced. But that literature in the first place, the function of that it is to be translated into English so that it gets a wider audience. She gives the example of a Chinese government project to translate the five classics which included five important works, important foundational works of Chinese literary culture. And uh, the project was to translate the five classics into eight different world languages. But this decision was also made that an English translation, mind you, not the original uh, Chinese work, but the English translation of the Chinese work will serve as a base text for all of these translations. So we find that this is certainly a way in which hierarchy, power and privilege operates in within certain literary systems. The original Chinese work as Shields had been trying to point out, it fades into insignificance. The particular, the peculiar becomes less significant and less important once the act of translation is complete. This is what she meant when she spoke about the one-way bridge. One-way bridge is a translation that happens from Chinese language to English language and after this process the Chinese language, the work which is written in the original Chinese language that becomes irrelevant. Now the new base becomes the work which is now translated into English language which then also means that English then becomes the original from which the work gets translated into different other languages. And uh, she underscores and uh, reiterates this point that translation is now always towards English and it is never in the opposite direction. In she quotes Owen's words, as in any cross-cultural exchange that goes in only one direction, the culture that receives influence will always find itself in the secondary position. It will always appear slightly behind the times. That incidentally is the current fate of national literature. It is now slightly behind the times. The implications of this is that appearing behind the times is the fate of national and regional literatures when they are viewed from the perspective of a rising world literature that aims to be translated into English. The beauty about Caroline Shield's essay is that she's not trying to be judgmental about this fact. She's only trying to make us attentive towards these different challenges and how these challenges could be incorporated towards newer possibilities as far as world literature is concerned. So here she is talking about this cluster of the regional, the national and the global coming together. And here again an inevitable thing happens where the local artist becomes a synonym for an insignificant artist and the national dams with faint praise. International is now a selling point itself. She is introducing to us different clusters which needs to be seen together in order to understand this complicated affair that world literature is about the regional, the national and the global and how here the significance of an artist, the significance of a work is also seen in the way in which the work sells, the work generates revenue and here she's also placing the regional, the national and the global within a more commercialized, globalized context. The advent of the internet of course brings in a lot of other challenges as well as possibilities at the same time to quote Kathleen Shields, buying books on the internet which was unthinkable in the previous era, reading them on screen and not as pages on a book and downloading samples and fragments of books are all activities which change the way texts are produced, translated and received. So the argument here is also that one needs to move beyond the ways in which world literature was conceived in the early 19th century from the late 18th to the early 19th century. We need to move beyond the way in which it was seen as wealth literature by Goethe and look at the different changing ways in which texts are being now produced, translated and received. The advent of the internet coincides with the transformation of comparative literature into world literature 
while the invisibility of translation and of linguistic and cultural specificity also fits this new model seamlessly. Again, as I pointed out, Shield's essay is a clarion call to be attentive to the new changes which are coming about and also to evaluate or rather re-evaluate translation and world literature in the context of these changing scenes. And when she's talking about the possibilities ahead, she finds Evan Zohar's polysystems theory extremely useful. And this is how she asks this question at the outset of the essay. Could polysystem theory help to re-examine the filters and asymmetric relations that exist between producers and consumers of literary texts? Here she is urging us to re-evaluate the relation between the producers and consumers of text because a lot of things have changed since Goethe coined the term wealth literatura in the late 18th or the early 19th century. So who is Evan Zohar? He's an Israeli culture researcher. He's been working on developing theoretical tools and research methodology for dealing with the complexity and interdependency of sociocultural systems. And polysystem theory, now there are various theories following Zohar's uh, pioneering work. Uh, this is can be seen as a framework for explaining the complexity of culture within a single community and between communities. Now you also begin to see how this all fits in well. What uh, Evan Zohar and his polysystem theory did was to analyze sets of relations in literatures and languages. And he also in this process as it progressed began to shift towards a more complex analysis of socio-cultural systems. And again, here there's a way in which one could look at this as a single cluster as literature, language, and the socio-cultural systems within which they are embedded. And this kind of work, polysystems theory, it was originally more relevant in Spain and China, but the way in which uh, Kathleen Shields is placing the significance of polysystems theory or the different theories which are now emerging, she says that this could be used to analyze any kind of translation process which is happening within cultures or across different cultures and traditions. And even Zohar's polysystems theory from the time that he conceived and uh, from the time it became more accessible, it said that it transformed translation studies from a marginal philological speciality to a focus of intercultural research. The main argument and the underscoring point of this essay is also this shift the need to be attentive, the need to see this shift which has already been happening, the shift from seeing translation as a marginal philological speciality towards a focus of intercultural research. The meaning of translation, the function of translation and the political act that translation performs will become more visible and more accessible only when we look at this. Uh, Evan Zohar had published one significant essay titled The Position of Translated Literature Within the Literary Poly System. You could perhaps take a look at it to get a more significant and more detailed understanding of how poly systems theory works. In the essay, The Position of Translated Literature Within the Literary Poly System, Evan Zohar attempts to clarify his position in various ways and this work has also been accessed by a lot of uh, practitioners of translation from across the world and here she, he is also making some significant arguments that translated literature is not only an integral system within any literary poly system but a most active system within it and he plays continuously on this term active the way in which translation is seen as an active process and he also says that translated literature participates actively in shaping the center of the poly system and Evan Zohar's work also challenges the hypothesis that translated literature may be either a central or peripheral system. On the contrary, even Zohar brings in this new argument that this does not imply that it is always wholly one or the other. There is no way in which a binary can be brought in when one talks about translated literature. It, one cannot say that the translated literature in all systems will either be at the center or be at the margins or the periphery. There's no formula which works like that. It depends on the system within which the translation act takes place, which is where he thinks it's important to look at the poly system, the multiple systems within which literature and translation 
happens because it's only when you see it as a cluster you begin to see how translation affects the center and how the center also affects this process. Even Zohar's work was largely on a Hebrew literary policy system. He gives this example of Hebrew literary policy system between the two world wars and he gives this example that during this period the literature translated from Russian language it assumed an unmistakably central position while the works translated from English, German, Polish and other languages assumed a peripheral one. So this is how the, this poly system works. Only when one is in, attentive to this integral system and the multiple modalities within which this works and the multiple realities within, within which this is embedded, only then perhaps a more holistic analysis is uh, possible. So what is Kathleen Shields trying to argue out? She says that what is required at this point is a study of translation which moves away significantly from the earlier dated practices and conceptions. And she says that this can be achieved by looking at translation, looking at the study of translation as a way of mapping out asymmetries between literatures in order to arrive at not only an aesthetics of translation but also a geopolitics of literature. This is an extremely important point that Shields is trying to make that when you are looking at translation, when you are looking at practices of translation, it's important to move beyond the aesthetics, beyond the ethics. But what becomes important in perhaps reshaping the whole idea, in reshaping the idea of a world literature canon is also in looking at the geopolitics of literature. Again, uh, a set of different clusters that she continues to encourage us to take a look at about globalization and literature, how they continue to shape and uh, define and redefine their roles, how the intermittent connection is now already there. And also to be attentive to this link between transmission, representation and transculturation. And translation needs to be seen as this one thing which can perhaps take a look at all of these clusters from a single vantage point. And um, translation of course gives us this perfect vantage point from which you can access these different concepts which are now embedded within different systems, different literary systems, different socio uh, cultural systems, different historical systems and even different political systems. So translation then we are coming back to the original point that was being made that it should be about connecting inside to outside regardless of the hierarchy of languages which are at place, regardless of the politics which is at work where again a certain kind of hierarchy is operating. It's important to continue to see as translation as an act that connects the inside to the outside only then the asymmetries which are now prevalent between literatures can be mapped out and even be perhaps leveled out to a certain extent. Kathleen Shields as she begins to wrap up this essay, she also gives some interesting examples through which she talks about the challenges and the prospects. I read this excerpt from uh, Shields essay, how does this map of world literature look? Prose fiction and to a lesser extent lyric poetry written in English or translated and written to be translated into English are the current dominant forms. Prize winning best selling novels in their English translations tend to exemplify a formal blandness, a flattening out, a homogeneity. The tropes of this narrative fiction resemble ethnocentric translation strategies. For example, ethnographic explanations, lengthy descriptions, local color and explanatory notes. Images and predominance in poetry translated into English at the expense of the auditory qualities of language and I include with this poetry the literature of spirituality in translation. Literature composed in English itself starts to read like literature in translation. These are some of the nuances that Shields wants us to be attentive to if we want to undertake a serious reading of the translation practices in the context of world literature. And she give, leaves us with this very interesting example. For example, Athav Soif in The Map of Love has a protagonist who is a cultural intermediary learning Arabic and reflecting on its grammar while a glossary is provided at the back of the novel. In the novel, Isabel reads out a list of vocabulary from a grammar notebook, Umm, mother, also the top of the head, Umm, nation, hence Amama to nationalize. So how can they say Arabic is a patriarchal language? 
So, this is a way in which Shields has very interestingly brought together the challenges and the prospects. She gives us this example to tell us how perhaps there is still a hierarchy at work, but at the same time, a close analysis, a closer reading would also tell us that there is a kind of a level playing ground which also gets generated through this process. Uh, of course, there is a homogeneity which is at work, there is a hierarchy which is at work, there is the local flavor, there is a particularity which is getting erased altogether, but at the same time, this world, this new emergent world is not without prospects. As Shields wraps up this work, she leaves us with some interesting possibilities. She of course agrees that there is an imposed uniformity as it was shown in this example of Arabic language. There is of course an imposed uniformity and this also serves to undermine all individual traditions whether this is a good thing or a bad thing is something that we need to debate at a different point of time. So what Shields leaves us with at the end of this essay, the translation studies needs to be seen now from a different paradigm to see how specific traditions engage with overarching ones and also how bilateral translation encounters take place between literary subsystems. The key is perhaps to look at the systems and look at the clusters within which these practices and these acts and these literary works themselves are embedded. And it is in this that Shields argues that lies the possibility of discovering new knowledge which she also think is the need of the, the current need of the hour as far as world literature and its many discussions are concerned and one can't entirely disagree with Shields. With this I also wrap up this lecture. I encourage you to take a look at Kathleen Shields essay and look through the main arguments that she is trying to posit before us. I am sure that this will be an enriching experience for you which will also alter the way in which you look at world texts, world canon and world literature itself. I thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.